From Washington, D.C., it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the event, Women Transforming Peace, celebrating 20 years of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 and beyond. My name is Kathleen Keenest, and I direct Gender Policy and Strategy for the United States Institute of Peace, and I am delighted to serve as your moderator for today's event. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Institute, USIP was founded in 1984 by Congress as an independent, nonpartisan national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, it is practical, and it is essential for US and global security. We are so pleased to co-host today's event with the US Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. Established in 2010 as an engaged coalition, the working group offers expert analysis and awareness to the effective implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda in US policy. Included now is the US Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017. With over 50 organizations making up the membership of this working group, USIP has been proud to serve as the secretariat over this last decade. 20 years ago, the UN Security Council sparked a global policy revolution when it recognized for the first time the unique experiences of women and girls in violent conflict. Resolution 1325, or what we like to call Women, Peace and Security, or you may hear the acronym WPS, laid a foundation for governments and also civil society to place women at the center of peace processes and as essential builders of peace. After two decades, however, and despite national action plans and legislation in 84 countries, women remain undervalued in peace building and we know today seriously underrepresented in peace processes. So today we want to better understand this policy framework established in the year 2000, but also look beyond the policy for other ways to achieve women's meaningful participation in peace and security moving forward. Our discussion will look at the various ways that countries are expanding on women, peace and security by adopting new approaches, including a feminist foreign and development policies and how civil society organizations are investing in masculinities programming as a complementary approach. These and other frameworks may prove as effective or more effective in advancing gender equality in peace and security, especially in light now of the challenges posed by COVID uh, pandemic, where early studies indicate that women are finding themselves in precarious predicaments from an increase in domestic violence to diminishing economic opportunities for women worldwide. We'll talk about worldwide. Today, the audience is joining us from across the globe. We had 760 registrations, so we are thrilled to welcome you all, and we want you to be a part of the discussion today. And I will remind you a little later in the conversation, but to ask a question, there is a chat function right below your video player where you're watching this event. You can put your questions in there, or you can submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag Women Advance Peace. We hope you'll use your social media and amplify these women peace builders who will be talking with us today. It is now a great honor to introduce you to Canada's first ever Ambassador for Women, Peace and Security. Ambassador Jacqueline O'Neill, who has advised the Government of Canada on its first and second national action plans 
on women, peace, and security. She is a well-known career security professional who has helped support the development of national security strategies in more than 30 countries. She has been a long proponent for women, peace, and security, working in such organizations as NATO and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the United Nations. Ambassador, we look forward to your remarks. Greetings, everyone, and bonjour from beautiful Ottawa, Canada. Huge thanks to the U.S. Institute of Peace for convening us on this anniversary as you have convened us over decades. I was thinking the other day that when I was living in D.C., there was a period where, and it's no exaggeration, the ride-sharing app that I used on my phone had two default options. So every time I opened it, it asked me if I wanted to go home or to the U.S. Institute of Peace. And that's a reflection, I think, of how often you opened your doors to this work. And to my mind, there is no better group to mark this anniversary with uh, than civil society. It's because of the expertise and determination of civil society that we have Resolution 1325 in the first place, and it will be civil society who continues to be the lead driver towards full implementation and actual accountability. I think we have a lot to be proud of over the last 20 years. And when I think about Resolution 1325 specifically, it's always striking to me that this is the most translated Security Council resolution ever. So it's been translated into over 100 languages, and we know that the majority of those translations were done by women peace builders who wanted to bring this into their communities. As you all know, we now have 10 resolutions specifically related to women, peace, and security at the Security Council, several operations mandates and other resolutions with relevant language. We have 85 countries with national action plans, several multilateral organizations with dedicated policy or plans, like the African Union, the OSCE, NATO, and more. We have several communities with local action plans, and we have a handful of countries with feminist foreign policies. Our community of activists and scholars and advocates has also grown, and often we do function as a community much more, sharing experiences and resources and expertise and more. But we all know well that we are still not seeing the changes we need in terms of investment in prevention, impacts on peace processes themselves, justice for survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, and so much more. We see Afghan women still fighting for significant and direct representation in peace talks. We see Mali, a country in crisis, announced a new government last week with only four women, meaning they comprise 16%. That's despite having a quota by law of at least 30%. Representation of uniformed women in peacekeeping still hovers around 5%, and women peace builders are still dramatically underfunded. The challenges we're facing are tremendous and they're varied. We're seeing a rise of authoritarianism, so far too many examples of strongman governments that are exploiting the pandemic in particular to crack down on citizens organizing and mobilizing, on their freedom of speech, on their ability to gather. We're seeing populism, nationalism, and an associated regression of women's rights globally and a growing backlash towards gender equality. We're seeing coalitions forming at the UN and elsewhere, united by the aim of restoring the, quote, natural family or opposing, quote, gender ideology. We're seeing a rise of China, which Anne-Marie Goetz has written about, which has increased its military and financial and diplomatic support to many countries, all the while enhancing its influence while rejecting the conditioning of that external support on democratic governance and respect for human rights. We're facing climate change and cybersecurity threats and more, and we are still, quite frankly, wasting our time, still having to make the case that there are deeply gendered dimensions to those issues and that women need to play a direct and significant role in every aspect. The COVID-19 pandemic represents an existential threat to many women peace builders and community level women led organizations. And despite, despite the fact that what has become so apparent from the pandemic is what advocates of women, peace and security have been talking about for years, which is that we need a much broader understanding of what defines security. That's what this work is all about. It's recognizing that all of the guns and tanks in the world are powerless in the face of a disease and weak health systems, 
of big portions of population, populations facing violence in their own homes, committed by intimate partners, and much more. And that said, I think that the pandemic is creating windows for change. And crucially, the Black Lives Matter movement is creating windows for change and for genuine introspection and honesty about our institutions and about us as individuals. And I see a lot of reasons for hope. So I'll end by sharing just three. So first, I see a potential for a lot more nuance going forward on anything gender related. There's a lot more recognition of intersectionality and movement away from stereotypes and thinking about women as a homogenous group. Both the pandemic and Black Lives Matter movement have driven home the absolute importance of collecting gender desegregated data. So by gender, but also by race, by ethnicity, by ability, sexual orientation, age, much more. We need much more nuanced data because ultimately we need much more nuanced policy solutions. Second reason for hope is that I see much more attention to power, which ultimately involves the use of more feminist approaches. I see growing conversations about inequality and about changing systems and practices that go far beyond representation to look at power dynamics. And that's how we need to remove barriers that prevent people from realizing their full set of rights. And third, we're seeing relationships changing between young people and governments, and governments generally in the people that they govern, but particularly with young people. So people are seeing treatment of others around the world and can compare how governments are treating them. You know, they see on the phones that they carry in their hand, the extent of inequality, the access to basic rights that other people have. And I think government itself now is more important than ever, but the ways that it engages citizens have to change. And young people in particular are really redefining what people expect and will accept from those who govern them. And that comes back to women, peace and security because it involves all people, particularly women, having a real voice in decisions that affect every aspect of their lives. And to me, that's the essence of women, peace and security. I'll never forget being at a workshop at USIP, of course, related to lessons learned on the conflict in Afghanistan or, or something similar. And one participant made the very relevant point that we should be referring to lessons identified, not lessons learned, because we have no evidence that they've actually been learned and fed back into a system. So I think we're at a moment of identifying lessons, and I think it's up to all of us to make sure that they're actually learned. I'm so grateful that we're using the 20th anniversary to do both, to reflect, but to also to plan. So thanks again for bringing us together, Kathleen and the rest of USIP. It's a very special community and I'm really grateful to mark this anniversary with you. Take care everyone, thanks. Thank you, Ambassador O'Neill for your warm words, your very cogent analysis of our current predicament both the challenges and, as you pointed out, the opportunities of these real voices as we mark the 20th anniversary of 1325. It's always great to see you and we look forward to working with you hand in hand as we move forward. I would now like to turn our attention to our three distinguished panelists who I will introduce to you now. Uh, before I do so, I'm sending my best wishes to our colleague, Anthony Keedy. Uh, unfortunately, he's unable to join us today due to some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we will uh, still address the issues of surrounding masculinities in women, peace and security, but we well miss Anthony's voice in our conversation today. So I first want to uh, introduce uh, Rita Lopedia, who is the executive director and co-founder of EVE Organization for Women Development in Juba, South Sudan. She is joining us from Juba this morning and afternoon there um, as she has worked and developed this organization to help women's participation in decision making, reconciliation, peace building, and conflict resolution in South Sudan. We know uh, amid South Sudan's brutal warfare, Rita has led women in seizing a peacemaking role. For her dedication and lifelong commitment to peace, Rita has the distinction of receiving 
the inaugural 2020 U.S. Institute of Peace Women Building Peace Award. I will return to you shortly, Rita, but I'm going to introduce your fellow colleagues here. Also joining us on the panel today is Sanam Naragi Anderlini, who is the founder and executive director of International Civil Society Action Network, known to many of us as ICANN, and has over two decades of experience as a peace strategist working globally on conflicts, crisis, and violent extremism with a mix of civil society, governments, and also the United Nations. At ICANN, she spearheads the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, known as WASL, comprising of independent women-led organizations active in 40 countries globally, who are working daily to prevent violence and to promote peace, rights, and pluralism. She will share with us in a few minutes uh, her own experience as being a civil society leader and one of the original drafters of the historic UN Security Resolution 1325. So Sanam, welcome as well. And we are also joined by Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who is the founder and president of Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and conflict transformation. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and president of Global Connections for Change. She previously served as coordinator for threat reduction programs at the US Department of State in the Bureau of International Security and Non-Proliferation. And she represented the United States at four nuclear security summits between 2010 and 2016. Ambassador Jenkins has made significant strides to advance the leadership and professional development of women of color in the fields of international peace, security, and conflict transformation. So welcome all of you. I'm looking forward to the next hour and a few minutes to uh, learn more about who you are and what you're doing in your life and in your work on women, peace, and security. And I want to begin uh, with Rita in Juba today. Um, as the 2020 recipient of the Women Building Peace Award, congratulations. Uh, you certainly have proven your dedication to advancing peace in your community. But can you tell us more about you and your work and actually kind of give us a feeling of what does it look like to be a woman transforming her community for peace. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin, um, for this great event and for inviting me to be part of this. Um, and greetings to all from Juba, South Sudan. Um, I will be giving a reflection of my journey uh, of knowing 1325 and uh, uh, as today we reach the 20th anniversary, uh, it has been a long journey and I'm very happy to be with Sanam on this um, panel. And she's been one of those who drafted, but some of us just join in uh, midway. Um, so I got to know about the resolution um, 1325 way back around 2008 when um, I and my friends formed EVE Organization for Women Development. And uh, we were passionate about issues of women and girls. Uh, but you know, when you, you, you are passionate about something, but you don't know where do you anchor this, you want to teach people about leadership, you want to participate, but you're not sure of where and how to start. Uh, then we were introduced uh, to 1325 by an organization called Operation 1325. It's a Swedish organization. So when I learned about the, um, the, the, the resolution, it was the wow moment for us as EF organization. Uh, when we learn about the four pillars, this participation, we were like, yeah, but this is what we want to do. Issues of protections, yes, but this is relevant to us. 
And then the issues of prevention of conflict is like, oh, it really speaks to the context of our country uh, when Sudan was still one. And then uh, the, the relief and recovery bit is like uh, there is peace, so there will be a lot of work around relief and recovery. So this is actually what we want to do as, um, as people or young women who are very passionate about the issues of women leadership and, and also girls' education. So we decided to anchor EFO organization uh, on the resolution 1325. And we took it up from there uh, to, 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 to work through with other women, you know, between 2018 and 20, uh, 2011, there were a lot of things happening in Sudan with the Sudan elections, the census and the South Sudan referendum. So we ran with the resolution. Uh, mobilizing women to participate in the elections, in the census, as well as in the referendum of South Sudan. And uh, eventually, uh, those who will monitor or who will see the statistics, huge number of women turn out uh, to vote for the referendum. And of course, we had a new country, a new country with a lot of challenges, but there were a lot of excitement uh, in the fact that this is now a new country, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, at first, we didn't even understand the 25% affirmative action, but then with 1325, we became very clear about it. We used the resolution to push for women's participation in the um, transitional constitution process, and we had more women in, in the commission. And uh, we started talking about forming the civil society working group on 1325. We started raising awareness on the resolution because we thought we had a new country and the resolution will really help us uh, move South Sudan from conflict now into stability. So if organizations started working with the civil society and the momentum was there, uh, but unfortunately the country in 2013 went back into conflict. And because we were already on the forefront, we found ourselves being questioned. So, hey, now we are back to conflict. Women are being killed, displacement, what are we going to do? And that was a new experience to, uh, for us as EVE organization. And as young women, we found ourselves on the forefront. Then we took the resolution again to advocate, you know, for access for women in the peace process. Um, and then later on with the revitalization process, because the country went back to conflict in 2016, we realized before even the second conflict, as women, we sat down and, and we mobilized women as EFE organization, we sat down and said, what if the peace process doesn't go right? What can we do? So we had a plan A and a plan B. And plan A was basically if things work well, these are the priorities of women to ensure women participate, the issues of transitional justice, the issue of protection of women and reparation for women. But if it doesn't work, then we have to up our game on advocacy. And all of this we have been, we have been using this framework for, for 1325. But we all know that in a situation of conflict, it is so scary to stand up for the truth. And uh, it is not a popular thing. You have to stick your neck out there and speak up. Uh, but because we use the resolution and uh, we know that member states, uh, for instance, like South Sudan signed to it. And we are like, this is the tool we will use. Be it the warring party or the government, they are a member state of the UN. So we are going to use this resolution to speak out the truth and to demand for the protection and participation of women in the peace process. We mobilize women again and, uh, you know, with support of um, partners, we are able to ship women to, to Addis, to advocate, and always as a point of advocacy, we refer to the resolution. And um, I think the mediators were also aware of that. And that actually helped in opening up the space for women uh, to be at the table. And eventually a number of women are signatories uh, as stakeholders to the revitalized peace agreement. And not only signatories, but they are key articles in the agreement that refer to addressing women issues. 
in terms of humanitarian access, in terms of participation, in terms of uh, protection of women. And we even work to ensure that refugee women are also represented in the process. All this we were able to do because we use the advocacy, uh, we use the resolution as an advocacy tool. And um, now we are in the implementation phase. Things are moving on slow. Um, there is still the issue of political will to really implement the, the, the issues to, to deal with having more women in decision making. We will get back to that later on with the challenges of why we have the resolution, but there are still challenges of uh, the political will to get things moving. Uh, but I think um, in the context of South Sudan, you see how we use the resolution throughout when there was relative peace, then we are back to conflict. And then now in the implementation, we are still using the resolution. So I think some three points that I will put over is that I think the, 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 the framework itself, 1325, provide direction to anyone who doesn't, who have a passion but doesn't know how to start. And uh, it is the reason as EF organization now, we are working with young women because as young women, we, were, we didn't know what to do. But right now we are helping a lot of young women uh, to know the resolution, but also the other related resolution, including 2250, which is more on youth and uh, equipping them with these tools to use for advocacy. And then secondly, this resolution today is able to bring us globally together. And these are common issues, the issue of participation, protection, prevention, and relief and recovery. It's a global thing. It reminds me of, of my Catholic faith. You know, in the Catholic faith, we say the homily is global every Sunday. And um, these four pillars are global, and it brings women from all corners of the world to work with this resolution to open ways and to address issues affecting women. And it also gives you the confidence to demand for your rights. And I think these are strong points that I would like to put over. And this is the experience that we have lived in South Sudan. And I'm happy to share this with the audience today. Thank you, Kathleen. Rita, thank you so much. I, I, I love that image. Uh, I ran with the resolution. I mean, and you've really painted a story here for us to to really see the, as you said, the flexibility and yet the continuity of this framework, it's common language globally and how it, you know, all ships rise in confidence as, as one group gains confidence, we all are with you in your efforts there in uh, Juba today. I'm going to come back to you with a few more questions, but I'm going to turn now to our colleague Sanam uh, Naragi Anderlini. And uh, Sanam, it's not the first time I've asked you this question, but I do remember you quite early on as one of those original drafters. And I can, I recall the first time I met you, it, it was like, wow, she had one of the pens that helped craft this original resolution. And as Ambassador O'Neill pointed out, has been translated into more languages than any other resolution. Tell us about it and how did you get into all of this, Sana? Thank you. Um, it's, it's lovely to be here with you. I can't imagine a better group of people to be marking and celebrating, or at least marking. I don't know whether we're celebrating it, but um, these 20 years. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, for me, it has two dimensions in a way. Um, it's very personal, um, just like Rita's story. Uh, um, as, as I have aged over the last 20 years and I reflect back on kind of what drove me into the space, it's really basically kind of a lifetime experience. I was 11 when the Iranian revolution hit our lives and we were kind of suddenly flung out into the world. Um, I didn't see my dad for seven years. And it was interesting as I looked back, as I, as I sort of became an adult, um, to realize that the revolution had basically forced women into the front, front lines. So when my mother talked about her experiences of being in Iran and her brothers being arrested and, and in jail, it was women who could go visit them. The men had to take a back seat. My father lost his job. When, when we came into exile, again, the men were stuck there and it was women having to take the mantle of responsibility and, and, and be 
so taking on so it was it was kind of the subtext if you want of my life of my life literally of age 11 onwards but um but what i was always interested in was this question of um why is it that violence becomes the norm why it, violence you know when you think about all the horrors that that we experience in the world you know tsunamis and earthquakes and so forth um war and violence are the ones that are entirely man-made they are entirely every every bullet that you shoot every bomb that you drop um is into every sort of element of torture that that people might experience it's always somebody is deciding that and it can be undecided it can be you can take a different path to resolve your conflicts so for me the 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 issue was you know the rupture in my own country and and the rupture that has continued you know for for most people the iranian revolution is history for me it's present um i can't go back to iran to visit my father's grave because i might get arrested for who knows what right so it's kind of an ongoing crisis and i was i in my 20s i was interested in the very simple idea of saying i would like to do something so that nobody else goes through what i went through and that we can help others resolve or transform their conflicts nonviolently i was inspired by south africa at the time it was the 1990s and and it, you know the mandela story and 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 the south african women and, and and so forth and um i was working i'd started working at international alert and we had the first global conference of women women's experiences of war and peace and we had women from 50 countries in in this one very small very um kind of tightly packed conference room and that was my aha moment because all of a sudden you know we'd been talking about conflict prevention and structures and early warning systems and so forth but the fundamental challenges that we had was we have an international system that is designed on respect for sovereignty of state and non in principles of non-interference and yet we were dealing with conflicts that were increasingly civil wars and internal conflicts which meant that that international system was limited in how it could engage and so the question for me was who who responds who is the first who are the first people to address the humanitarian crisis to stand up and try and stop the violence um to take action in in some sort of ways and it was as i looked across the room and, and in the in the dialogues that we would have been having at, um with my colleagues it was that women are doing it and and they've always been sent central to war and peace it's just that they've always been taken for granted and they've always been the invisible forces and voices because we don't think of them as a unit of analysis either in terms of you know maybe victimhood but de definitely not as agents of change and that was the moment where we said given how global this is and given and as rita said this i mean it, it it the the reason why this agenda continues to be relevant is because there's a universality of experience through time and geography frankly of when you have conflict and war what happens and where are women in this space and so at that in 1998 we said we need to bring this and have a common shared global vocabulary that was the beginnings of an idea for a campaign called women building peace from the village council to the a negotiating table and as part of this campaign and, and program at international alert we said it should have a policy pillar and the policy pillar there was a participation pillar and a partnership pillar and others but as a policy pillar we said well, where do we go and it was the security council because that's the biggest that's the most important body the organization for security and cooperation in europe and then the european uh union and i was 20 i was by this time i was 28 29 years old and i was told go get a security council resolution and i didn't know how the system worked all i knew was i needed to have a coalition and 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 you know so we had all we'd been doing consultations around the world in conflict areas and rita coming back to your point that's why the resolution speaks to rita in 28 2008 and it speaks to yemeni women in 2015 and you know probably speaks to belarusian women in 2020 it was consultations on the ground that helped us distill the key elements we went to new york we part, i you know found my partners in in other ngos and and there was a group of us and i and i actually want to mention the names of the women that were fronting this it was um my colleagues in london were yehenia pisa lopez and ansel adrian paul one was guyanian one was uh yehenia's uh, costa rican and mexican in new york it was aisha daifan who was sierra leonean and had left sierra leone because of the war um mahamuna who was palestinian american 
um, Cora Wise and Betty Reardon, who were like doyens of American peace movement and, 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 and yet so generous in terms of working with us who were much younger women. Um, Felicity Hill, who was Australian and, and came from a nuclear weapons background. This was our sort of cohort of people um, that we would go and lobby government, you know, like the, uh, the NGO, uh, the, the ambassadors. And when we had the Commission on the Status of Women meetings, we invited all of the governments to come to the caucus where we had 60 organizations from war zones, women's organizations from war zones, talking directly to, we invited the whole of the Security Council. We invited all sorts of you know, ambassadors through the time, partly because as a young woman, I didn't know that this wasn't the protocol of how NGOs are meant to relate to governments. I was like, well, why not? They're people, we're people, they're governments, there are governments. And so, so this, this kind of sense of possibility of why not and why shouldn't we and who says that it has to be done a certain way and so forth, that ability to just think outside the box um, and think about it in a constructive, collaborative way was something that really helped. And our message that resonated was women build peace. The problems are complex. You can't do it alone. And this, I think, again, is something that is coming back again now, um, 20 years later, as, as the really transformative element of, of, of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. And thank you for mentioning your cohort. You know, I, I love that. I love the fact that, uh, you know, again, we, we, we have to make visible and speak the names of those who have played a very significant role in this unique um, and 20 years enduring resolution. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, we will come back around for another set of questions here. I'm gonna turn now to uh, our colleague, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, lifelong diplomat, peace builder, um, You've seen it all from the policy side, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, many foreign policy efforts. So I'm really interested in uh, your entryway into this uh, unique resolution, and also you know, your inputs on how a feminist foreign policy adds to our approach here. Great. First of all, thank you, uh, Kathleen, for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists, Arita, for all the work that you do, and congratulations for receiving the award. You certainly deserve it. And it was very uh, enlightening to hear what you had to say, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more. And, and of course, Sanam, good friend, uh, thank you for what you've done as pioneering and for your colleagues for pioneering this work. Um, and uh, yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but we do want to celebrate uh, that we have this and we, we have something and a platform to work forward with. Um, as you said, Kathleen, my, my entree into this has been uh, from the policy side. Um, I have always been interested in working in, in the government uh, when I grew up in the Bronx, uh, New York, uh, starting to work in city government and state government and getting into the federal government uh, finally. And uh, I've been working in the area of international security, the quote unquote hard security side since the early 90s. Um, and during that time, I really got to see that there is a huge absence in the policy side, a huge absence in those who are making the policies that impact the US and uh, our colleagues internationally. Um, in between that time, I had a chance to work at the Ford Foundation. And while I was there, my, for, my, my portfolio was US foreign and security policy. But I also had the fortune to have a, a kind of a smaller pot of money that was dedicated to uh, something called conflicts. And in that area, I was able to fund work on issues of peacekeeping, peacemaking, child soldiers, uh, women in conflict, a number of areas. And that was really wonderful because it got to, it gave me an opportunity to complement the side of my work that's the quote unquote hard security side. And it gave me a perspective on security that was much broader uh, in terms of the work that's being done. Um, so when I when after that when I re-entered government uh, as an ambassador and I continued my work, um, I really got to ask my continue to ask myself the question, where is the diversity? 
in the for in the policy making community. Uh, where are the people of color? Where are just diverse voices of many respects? And you know, there really there really is a dearth of um, diversity in terms of the policy making uh, that's being done. Um, and you know, I dare say that it's just uh, the U.S., but there certainly is a diversity uh, lack in in the policies that we make on peace and security that affect people around the world on the ground, uh, which means there's a lack of perspective on what policies are being made, a lack of perspective and cultural sensitivities and gender sensitivities on not only how our decisions are made, but how they impact people on the ground, people who are doing the work, the people who are engaged. Um, and so for me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because so many of the areas of peace and security affect women predominantly, affect, affect uh, women of color predominantly around the world. And yet we were not at the table. So that was really my catalyst. That was my question. And that was a catalyst that led me to establish the organization, which when I did, and, and what Sanam says, it reminds me a lot of, of what I did was I wasn't sure how this would work. Um, I didn't know if there would be any interest in it. Um, I just knew that there was a need. Um, there were women of color who would approach me and, and say, I feel isolated. I feel like I'm the only one doing this. Um, you know, a lot of the you know, uh, imposter syndrome because you're the only one in the room that's different. And I was hearing this and I realized we need a network. We need a way for women to talk to each other, to know that, you know, you may be the only one in this room, but there's other women who are working on these issues. It may, there, there may not be a lot of us, but the ones who are, we need to connect. Um, and then there are areas where there are more women, but they're not at the at the high level decision making. You know, some areas of peace and security. And here I define peace and security broadly to mean not just the issues of quote unquote soft security and a quote unquote hard security, whatever those terms came from, but all the issues from climate change to infectious disease to weapons of mass destruction. Um, and it was important in my perspective for us to understand how our work relates, how our work connects, to get away from the silos, to understand that all of these issues are affecting women. All of these issues are affecting women of color predominantly. And we have to understand how they do and how they connect. Um, and we don't really do that. And so we, we, are, uh, we don't allow ourselves an understanding to understand, to, to see all these issues of security holistically. Um, it also made me recognize that we need to look at how we are defining security itself, um, because our definition is, was not, is not a definition that was ever one that reflects a diverse view. It's not a definition that reflects uh, women particularly or women of color uh, it, it's a, it, or, or, or LGBTQ or other groups. It's a, it's a definition that ref represents the, those who are in power. Um, and therefore, it can't possibly be representative of the security that all of us feel that we need and how we as individuals define it based on the culture, the subcultures that we grew up in. Particularly if you think about what's been happening recently with the racial issues that's been going on. You know, the, the people who grew, up, who grew up in the Bronx, for example, have a different definition of security than people who grew up in a different environment. Um, and so we need to have a security that really represents what all of us need to feel. And we need to have policies that implement um, ways in which we can all feel secure and not just a particular portion of a society that has a different perception and understanding of security. Um, so all of these are things that, you know, have been, have led to my starting the organization and trying to build a network of women in these areas who could focus on the policy making, but also important, and we could talk about this more later, is how we connect with women around the world. You know, how do we make sure that these policies really are doing service and doing what needs to be done uh, to help women around the world? Um, and just briefly on, you touched on uh, feminist foreign policy. I'll take just a minute to talk about that. You know, I've had the honor of being a part of a discussion of women who are putting together uh, a feminist foreign policy for the United States um, and understanding the ways in which we need to approach foreign policy. 
um, some of these uh, areas uh, that we are looking at in terms of food foreign policy is recognizing the importance of a more balanced approach to the way in which we do our foreign policy. So it's much more, much less militaristic in its view and approach and recognizes other important things like development, diplomacy, and uh, in other areas like climate change and immigration. Um, it focuses on a concept of intersectionality and importance of bringing all voices into the discussions of foreign policy. And it's a progressive, inclusive, right-based agenda uh, that really values working with allies and working with international institutions, recognizing that women's rights are human rights um, and that we are represented, we have to be representative, inclusive, and responsive and accountable to everyone. And it really centers on the experiences and expertise of women being at the table and also the important role of 1325. So these are some of the concepts of uh, feminist foreign policy, which I think, as you can see, really dovetails very well with some of the concepts and some of the thoughts that we're talking about today with 1325. So I think I'll leave it at that, Kathleen. Thank you for the question and looking forward to our, our next round. Yeah, thank you very much, Bonnie, and for, uh, you know, really helping us uh, d dive deeper into how we define security. I think sometimes uh, when we talk about women, peace, and security, we're really focused on the first word, women. But the security part is, is kind of like not often, you know, uh, explored enough. And I think in defining and how each of us experience security is a really uh, important lens that we need to talk more about. And uh, certainly the feminist foreign policy efforts that you're talking about are uh, a leap in that direction. Well, I'm going to uh, take one more round of just uh, questions. And I also want to open it up to the panelists to jump in on each other's questions or comments at this point. And after this round, then we're gonna open it up. We're already getting questions in from our audience. Uh, again, if you want to uh, join us for the Q&A, please use uh, the chat box function that's right below uh, the video player on the USIP event page. So I, I'm gonna come back to this question that each of you had about women peace builders. And, you know, are these humanitarian workers? Who are these women? You know, I, uh, Rita, you began with uh, what you called a wow moment, and then you found the resolution as part of your mapping to how to make change happen, whether it was going in your direction or not. But maybe we need in all of our work to understand who are these women peace builders? And I'm gonna open the floor. I'm not gonna go around. If anybody wants to jump in right now, go ahead, uh, unmute and we'll begin the conversation. Sanam, it looks like you're ready. <laughs> Definitely, thank you. Um, this is such an important con uh, question. Who are these women? Um, two weeks ago, I published a paper called Recognizing Women Peace Builders. And it's really kind of, it's like distilling 20 years of all this work that we've been doing, but actually trying to articulate that this is a community of practitioners. For many of us, it's a vocation, whether we're sitting internationally or, or sitting locally. And when you begin to look at how people have become involved in peace building, it's different experiences. So, so my colleague, Robina Robumbe, whose birthday it is today, and she's Ugandan, her story is very similar to mine. She became a refugee and went back to Uganda and thought, I don't want other people, I don't want other girls and young women to experience this. My colleague Visaka Dharmadasa was the mother of uh, soldiers. Her, her son was in the army in Sri Lanka. He went missing and she got a group of women together to go look for her son. And they ended up being the first ones to talk to the T Tamil Tigers in, in Sri Lanka and opening up the channel of communication. When you look at how people have become involved in, in peace building, there is a moment, um, I, I sometimes say it's women who run to the problem as opposed to running away from it. But if they start with, a, with this thing of I'm looking for my son, they end up being the mediators. If they have started with um, my colleague Mona Lohman, who was a poet in Yemen, and 
Beca you know, started doing food and starting try trying to mediate getting kids with who had cancer out behind from you know behind militia lines, and then realized that 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 the different parties in Yemen were recruiting children into their armed groups. And she said, children shouldn't be going to get a gun; they should be you know getting pens in their hands. It's it's people who start in one an through one entry point, and then eventually end up being the ones that not only are doing mediation and addressing rights, issues of human rights, um, and doing humanitarian work, but actually have the courage and the compassion to say, I have to talk to the other side. We have to find the humanity in each other, even if they are, they've been perceived or presented as the worst evil. At some point, we have to try and dig deep and find that and recognize that there are different truths and we need to get through that. Um, and, and to this day, you know, I can, when I, when I think about it, because you have to do it in your own context, right? So when I think about, can I do that with the, with the Iranian regime, with the people who have really affected my life on a personal level? It's really hard. It's really, really hard. I, I remember being in the, when I came to the States at some point um, in the, just after 9-11, and this whole question of Republicans and Democrats, right? And it's like, here you have politicians who are telling Israelis and Palestinians could, to talk to each other. And in this country, people couldn't sit in the rooms in the same room together, you know, as Republicans and Democrats. So, so this idea of are we willing to talk to the other side and, and find common ground and risk our lives? This to me is where I see women as women who become peace builders. And you know, we have peace builders, and then we have women who and, and the women, what's fascinating, and, and again in this paper I've tried to pull out, is that they will draw on faith, tradition, superstition whatever kinship ties, whatever it takes to further their goals for, for peace and justice. It's not just, oh, the law says this and I should do it. It's very much, I'm the daughter and so-and-so and, and my father is so-and-so and, and I can, you know, or in my culture in West Africa, in, in West African culture, if elder women, you know, expose themselves, um, it, it has all sorts of curses against the other side. So that's what they did in Sierra Leone. Elderly women lifted their skirts up and bared their bottoms to you know, to the RUF, and it propelled a movement um, in terms of uh, how, 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 you know, the moving, movement towards peace. So it's, it's amazing how they pull on other things, but at the core of it is this belief that we have to stop the violence. We have to sit down and talk. And, and one, of the, one of the issues that I just want to say is that, you know, in the, in the opening channel it, um, uh, credits, it said, peace is hard. No, peace is not hard. War is hard. War is awful. Sitting down and actually saying we can resolve a conflict by talking, maybe we have to shout, maybe we have to cry, maybe whatever it is, but talking is an awful lot more easier and, and more constructive than, than going to war. And, and I would say that, you know, Hobbes thinks that we're all violent. No, if Hobbes, Hobbes had looked at life through the lens of women and how women constantly are trying to sort of create norm normalcy and, 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 and the experiences of women's lives, um, we're, we're not as, as beings, I don't think we're necessarily violent. I, th I think our predisposition is to be peaceful and to try and coexist. And, and, and that's what we should be elevating. And, and, and this is what I see with women peace builders, that, they are, that at, at the heart they have this and there's a capacity for compassion, which is beyond, um, it's so inspirational. Uh, I, I would wish everybody in the world to know the women I work with, truly. Thank you. Bonnie, yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, pre, the, the definition is, I, I try to not to get too wrapped up in definitions um, because I like to get uh, kind of get underneath those. Um, and for me, peace builders are, I look at it broadly, kind of like the way I, where I do redefine in national security is, I look at the action and what people are doing and the, and the result that they're trying to achieve. Um, so we have peace builders who um, are, are many of the ones and all the ones that Sanam has mentioned. But I also include uh, women who are trying to make a change um, in the policies as well as how the policies are going to be uh, implemented and how things are being done, uh, you know, um, around the world. Um, one thing I always try to, well, it, I grew up, as I, as I, as I mentioned, I, my, my work started in the WMD world, what was the mass destruction world. And there's this, this dichotomy of thinking about whether those issues really fit into peace and security. Are those peace and security type actions? And I would say, well, preventing nuclear weapons is certainly promoting peace. 
you know, ensuring that we don't have to use nuclear weapons, trying to have treaties to prevent to on, on arms control and nonproliferation. When you have those treaties, that's promoting peace. That's to prevent conflict. That's to make sure we prevent the ultimate conflict. Um, uh, in the work that uh, I do, I've done on infectious disease and, and, and work, it's how do you build capacity? How do you, how do you uh, strengthen uh, capacity so it can prevent um, disagreements um, on, on issues of, you know, of scarcity issues? Um, so many things that we do are promoting peace and so many things that people do in terms of these issues are building peace or maintaining peace. Um, so when I look at the issue of peace and security, that's why I said I look at it broadly, because I want people to understand that even though we have in our minds sometimes separated what's peace and what's this other thing that's going on out there, to look at it more in terms of we are all playing a role in ensuring that we maintain peace. Whether it's you're doing something, you know, on the nuclear side or on the, you know, uh, mass atrocity side or, you know, you have to figure out where you fit but that's all promoting peace and ensuring that we're secure and ensuring that we prevent conflict. All right, I just want to thank you. And Rita, please, yes. Yes, I just wanted to add on uh, what has already been said. Um, women as peace builders, I think naturally as human beings, nobody wants to keep on, uh, on fighting or being in a state of conflict throughout their lives. And um, in the context of conflict, uh, it is evidence that it is the women that bear the brunt of, of, of the violence. And I'm bringing us back to our context in South Sudan. Uh, when the conflict erupted, you will find that it is the women uh, that, um, that are being violated in terms of uh, displacement. And when you displace a woman, you displace the whole uh, family. It is the woman that loses her husband in the conflict and she takes over the responsibility of, of the husband taking care of the family. You find that those who lost their livelihood, those who go for refuge, women don't normally go alone. You will find them carrying kids. You will find them carrying what they, they will use to cover themselves, what they will eat on the way, and how they can find shelter. And if they're on the way, uh, they will find some other kids that are stranded. No woman will leave other kids. So you'll find that in conflict, women move heavy. And the reason why, um, personally, I say women are peace builders, because the consequences that come with conflicts are too huge. And most of these responsibilities are being soldiered by the women. I have been in the refugee camps where most of the population are women and children because the men are either killed or are in the front line. I have been in situations where I see women who are not being able to get health facilities to treat their kids, this responsibility fall on them. Young women losing their lives because there is no maternal care. So all these things impact the woman first and then the family and then the community. And every woman would want to have peace, we want to have security such that the family, which is, um, which is, which is the core of humanity, can have some sort of breathing space and peace. That's why naturally um, I would say women are peace builders because we know the consequences that comes with conflict. Thank you, Rita. I'm gonna pick up on that before we go to the audience questions because I am aware that uh, Anthony is uh, not able to join us today. And I wanted to see if any one of you could speak to why this idea of masculinities in peace building um, has become an approach uh, to add to the women peace and security efforts. And I'm looking at Sanam, who I know has worked on this and anyone else before we move on to the audience. Thank you. I, th I think, so I, I did, um, back in 2008, I led a 10 country study for UNDP 
um, looking at men in violent contexts and young men in specific in particular. And I remember at the time they said to me, you know, we're looking at the question of toxic masculinity. And I said, you know, again, from my own personal experience of my cousins and my father and my uncles, and it was like, I want to, I want us to talk about the totality of men's experiences, right? And, and we designed a, um, a research project and I was out in the field and I was talking to gang members in Jamaica, um, ex-militias in Liberia, it's all sorts of people, and asking them as men what it was like, what do they fear, what, what's their experience. And the interesting thing is that nobody ever talks to the guys. Nobody ever says to the men, what was it like for you? You know, what is it like to, and, and, and when you have conflict so often, it's women who are hiding men. You know, in, in Nepal, they were telling us the army would come and then it's the women who would be standing at the doorway hiding their men, men and boys. The men are also scared. The boys are also scared. Um, and, and the issue of being able to take into, take into consideration that we take it as a norm that men and boys should go and fight. Why? Why are they being used for this fodder? Right? Who, on whose behalf are they doing this? How do we make sure that we're giving them alternatives to understand what is being done to them and also what else they can do in a positive way, basically, right? And, and one, of the, one of the areas of work that um, we've been doing with, through ICANN is we have a colleague in Afghanistan who started working with men and provided them these space, safe spaces, imams and village chiefs and, and, and young men, to actually talk about what it meant growing up through 40 years of war. And what do they want? And what violence has meant to them and their experiences? And then from there, teaching them about how children feel it, how women feel it. And they've become the champions of actually talking about nonviolent conflict resolution in their communities, stopping Taliban recruitment and, and, and so forth. Same in Iraq. We've had colleagues who basically worked with young men and said to them, jihad isn't spilling blood in the streets. It's, it's giving blood in the hospital. It's cleaning, doing God's work. You know, so it's not challenging the faith. It's providing an alternative sp sense of belonging dignity, manhood, you know, like positive role models of what it means to provide and to protect and so forth, as opposed to always this kind of the, the drive towards um, violence is, or, or, you know, uh, machismo is, is, the, is the way to do it. So there is this work that's going on on the ground and this engagement. But coming back to the resolution and, and our policy world, we got 1325. It was very much about women building peace, you know, kind of bringing women's voices. Then we came to 1820, and Resolution 1820 was about sexual violence and about recognizing that sexual violence can be a threat to international peace and security. In the, um, in the back channels, I like just that, you know, sitting at home with my laptop and my, one of my kids sick at home, um, we were back channeling in real time to the text of 1820 when it was being negotiated. And I kept putting in men and boys as victims of sexual violence, and it would come back and the text would be deleted. And we would say, well, why is it being deleted? And, and, you know, my colleagues from the different missions would say, the Libyans are on the Security Council, and they say men and boys are not, this doesn't happen to men and boys. So in that, in the text of Resolution 1820, we ended up getting women and girls, and then we put civilians, people, kind of gender neutral language as a way of trying to capture men's experiences. A few years later, I was at a meeting, and there was a chap there um, who'd written a big report um, about, the, about this issue, and his, he critiqued us by saying, you know, they passed this resolution and they didn't mention men and boys. And I, and I went up to him and I said, you do understand that I have the actual back and forth of emails and things to show we tried and we couldn't do it. But here's a thought, men and boys or women and girls have been victims of sexual violence in wars for 3000 years. Men have been in charge of these processes for 3000 years. You could have raised it. They could have raised it. It's only when women started talking about these issues that men then had the courage to come and say, actually, it happens to us as well, right? So it's constantly this thing that the minute you bring in the experiences of women and women's experiences of war, good or bad, the question then becomes, well, what about men? What about young men? So we, it's, like, it's like you put on a pair of glasses and you begin to see the multiplicity of human experiences. Um, and it's women fronting it that gives the courage for others to come and say, I was all, also vulnerable. I've also been victimized. I've also, I'm also scared. And by the way, I also don't want war. 
you know, I don't, I want to come with you. I don't want to go towards the, 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 the line of violence. So, so I, I, it's really important, these conversations, but I also think that it's really important to always kind of give credit where it's due in terms of how women have opened the door for, the, for, for this more colorful human, the total diversity of human experience um, around violence and, and issues. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to move to, because uh, we have quite a series of questions. Thank you all from the audience. Uh, I wish we could see you all. Uh, this is one of the, the downsides of Zoom, but the upside is that we can have all of the panelists right here in front of us and have such a great conversation. So one of the questions I have here from the audience is, how does one become an active peace builder beyond the spheres of family and local community? Rita, Bonnie, Sanam, how we've talked about a lot of different dimensions here today. Are there other approaches? Sanam, you're on mute. I was, I was just saying it would be, I'd love to hear from, um, from Bonnie and, and Rita, and then we can, we can, why, I, I'm happy to contribute as well. I have so many questions. If one wants to take it, I'll move on. We'll come back you, to the question. Oh yeah, Rita, go ahead. With the question. Absolutely. How does one become an active peace builder beyond the spheres of family and local community? Um. I think in, uh, in, in, in real life, or based on my experience, I would say, uh, being a peace builder first starts with you as a person, as a conviction, and then it goes to your community and goes to the national level, and based on that, you get to go to other levels that is globally. Um, um, but it needs to start with yourself, the experience you have, how you share with people, and then gradually you get to grow out of that space, uh, building the experience and being at the global level. The, and I, I would add to that, that um, the, the good news right now is that pretty much in any country you're in right now, and if you're interested in peace building, and as, as Rita says, you're beginning to sort of think about these things, um, there is probably an organization on the ground who is doing this, and we have the global network. So I work with Cameroonian women and, and you know, Colombian women and Afghan women. Everywhere we look, they emerge and they rise. And, the, and the, in the last 20 years, I think one of the biggest achievements that we've had is that our global um, collaboration and our global community of practice is incredibly strongly knit um, it's one one email away, right? So, so if you're interested, you know, and you're, you you want to know, look at our website. Call us. Uh, we're happy to connect you with with the with the folks that, that that we have, and it's a very open and welcoming community of practice as well. Yeah, I just want to add very briefly. I know we started with no one answering. Now we have three. <laughs> I guess <laughs> the, I, I would add, as, as, and I think it picks up um, is that it depends on your circumstances and where you are, and you know, in my in in my in the world that I have been in. Um, you know, for I impact it based on, you know, I'm in Washington, D.C. This is where I am. I care. I'm a, I, I care about these issues. So I want to make change based on where I am and where I can have the most effect. So I think it's really, as Rita said, it's basically what you're interested in, what you want to do and where you are at the time and what you can really what you feel you can impact based on based on where you are in your situation. So. Thank you all. That, those were great responses. And I, I'm going to keep just moving through these questions because they're thoughtful and, and uh, you know, asking for a response here. So how do we encourage women in African countries to participate more in democracy, peace processes, and peaceful protests against injustices and gender inequality in their countries? Rita, I'm going to turn to you on that one. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I will highlight a few points. Um, and, and I wanted to start a little bit taking us back to the issue of uh, the, 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 the toxic masculinity that's, uh, that is being addressed here. Um, 
in in most of our contexts or in most African contexts, we have patriarchal society. And in the society, most women are seen as the caregivers and uh, they provide um, care for the family. And uh, the boys um, um, uh, are given uh, leadership positions right from when they were kids. Um, a boy child is not supposed to, to, to cook or to clean the house. A boy child is not supposed to cry because you are a man. You have to man up. And, and some of these um, uh, cultural practices, eventually the man grow up with that. And uh, in most cases, it is also us women who encourages this uh, negative masculinity and uh, if, if a boy is cleaning the house or is cooking, uh, you'll be seen as not man enough. But with time, these things are changing. It's because of awareness and uh, because of education. And I think one of the things that we need to encourage more women in, in, uh, in my country and in other countries in Africa, in uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda is by continuously raising awareness and connecting the dots. And uh, for instance, I've shared earlier on that if um, it, I, I tried because I had the passion, but somebody else came and saw me struggling and, you know, uh, gave a helping hand. It's like, hey, how about this? And then I picked the resolution. And I think this is about passing on the baton. It's about connections. It's about networking. Um, training and also mentoring the young generation of leaders that they are aware. Um, we have a huge issue, for instance, in South Sudan, the issue of illiteracy, but it doesn't mean that these women do not know their rights. It's all about telling them, these are the frameworks you need to use, these are the rules or these are the policies that are in place, and they will be able to use these policies to become vocal and to be able to use these policies to address their issues. So I think the issue of uh, awareness raising, the issue of opening up the space uh, for women, the issue of networking and mentoring the young um, women, as well as looking into the, 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 the youth. Most of the time when we refer to youth, we refer to the boy uh, child or the, the young male. Um, uh, in, in our context in South Sudan, there are a number of um, young men who are now more uh, open to gender issues, and some of them see themselves as feminists, standing up for the rights of women. Uh, we have also seen a few men, even during the peace process, that supported the rights of women. So I think this sort of conversation, including men, and, and also raising the awareness for the young uh, men and women uh, on issues of equality, peace building is quite crucial in the context of Africa and in the communities as well. Can I just, yeah. Kathy, can I just sure, add so one thought to that? When I look back over my 20, 20 odd years of doing this work, the, for me, Africa, I mean, when you think about the women of South Africa, the women of Sierra Leone, the women of Liberia, the women of, of Sudan recently, um, the women of Somalia, right? The women of Cameroon, these women are there. And maybe one of the things that we should be doing more and more of is telling their stories and capturing it and conveying it in a way so that across the continent and across the world, people remember this history. Right, because if the history, if they're, if if we don't tell those stories, um, if they're not written into history, they're they're always going to be excluded, and it's always going to be as if, oh, in Africa or in Asia or in whatever in the Middle East, you know, women haven't ever done this. They, they've always been there, but it's the it's the privilege of of information, right? And and thinking about what is our responsibility for making sure that these stories are conveyed in an accessible way, so that whether you're literate or not, you know you know, those stories and you can build on it and, and, and be proud of it. Um, uh, you know, to me, African women have been across the continent have been extraordinary um, in, 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 in so much that, they, that they've achieved and, and, um, and have been pioneers, especially in this, in this question of being at the peace table or, or engaging in peace processes, inc including uh, Rita, of course. Well, and we know that these stories are what expand our imagination and, and so why they need to be visible and vocal uh, critical to the path forward. 
On the issue of uh, people, and especially women at the peace table, there is a question directed to you, Bonnie. Um, how can we ensure women's rights are not forgotten as a part of the uh, inner Af uh, Afghan peace negotiations, including their access to education and health care? Uh, that's a, th thank you for that question. I think that's really important to think about how, how these things are not forgotten. Um, I am very interested in, in picking up what Sanam was saying about telling these stories. I think that we should be telling these stories and we should be recording these stories uh, and we should be making sure that people understand the processes. We hear a lot about uh, the, the women in Afghanistan, but we're not, you know, it, it's not visible enough, I think. If the, what's happening and what's, what's, going, what's going on and the processes, I think, certainly need to be uh, a lot more understood um, by many, many more people. Um, one of the things that you know we were talking about even before we started today was, you know, how do we ensure that um, you know that everyone understands, but also the people who are not in those circles understand and know what's going on and know the important work and the hard work that's being done. Um, and those stories are not being told, or they're being told in silos. Um, and so we need to tell those stories, we need to record those stories, because we can learn, we can obviously learn from what's been happening before, but we need to highlight the important work that's going on, the amazing women that are at the peace tables trying to make change, trying to make peace, trying to uh, continue peace and make a change for the future. So um, for me, it's about record, not just telling the stories, but recording the stories and getting the word out there. And I certainly would definitely benefit and so would my organization benefit from hearing these stories. You know, we're trying to make change in policy, but how do we know that the policies that we're trying to make change is going to make is going to make a difference unless we hear from the from people whose policies we are impacting? Um, and so that's and we talked about how that, in my view, is uh, one of the gaps that we need to try to fix in the future. It's hearing those stories to make change and make sure that those change stay. Thanks. Thank you on that, Bonnie. I, I have a question here that I'd love to hear from each of you. What unconventional approaches have been found to be effective and why? I'm sure each of you have a story. What something you did or your, your uh, community did that was so unconventional, I think uh, Sanam has already mentioned the one from Sierra Leone, and of course we know about the one from Liberia through Back to Hell. But are there some other unconventional approaches that have been effective and why do you think they have been? Floor is open, Rita. All right, um, I think uh, because I've been involved in the South Sudan peace process since uh, 2014 and um, we had, uh, I, I can say an unconventional approach that um, uh, that, that happened during the 2014 uh, negotiation. Um, during the process, the mediators were really rigid and not wanting to give access to, to women. And um, we kept on pushing and pushing. Then eventually one of the women uh, who were also pushing uh, with us during those days, uh, she decided to, to lock up one of the secretariat staff in, in a room uh, with her inside. And so it's like holding her a hostage. And uh, she was asked to open the door several times and she said she will not open the door until she gets a confirmation that women will be allowed in. And I think that was because of the frustrations of, you know, always advocating and, and you know, talking to people that it's important, but you don't get feedback. So I think she got frustrated, locked up the woman, and she waited until um, the, the special envoy has to, the, the special envoy was brought and uh, he said, okay, open the door and uh, we'll let you in, in the negotiation. And she said, no, I'm not gonna open the door unless you do that in writing and signed it, then bring it to me when I read it, then I'll be able to open the door. And in fact, that was what they did. 
they wrote it down that yes, the women's group would get into the negotiation and uh, the chief uh, negotiator signed on it. And then they said, okay, we got the letter, open the door. And she said, no, you have to slip the letter from under the door so I can prove that it is true. So they slipped the letter, she opened the letter, she read it, then she opened the door. And I think what happened because that was so unconventional and uh, so she was deported um, uh, because they took it seriously. She was deported from, uh, from Ethiopia. And, uh, but then her action actually led to other women to get access. So she sacrificed, uh, she had to go that extra step to allow other women now to have access into the process. And uh, that, that was one of, um, and I think that was based on, on the pressure and the push and the frustration that women get around peace tables. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, it's another form of community in that way. Taking risks like that for the community to make change happen. So Nam or Bonnie, do you have an unconventional? Um, I've been struggling to figure out what I've done conventionally over the last, everything I've done. I mean, but, but, but here's, going back to Bonnie's point about, you know, you, you figure out what you, where you're situated and what your entry points are yourself. So for me, uh, given that I've worked internationally on these issues and given that um, I, uh, I am in the kind of dealing with the UN and, and others, but coming in from civil society, um, there was, there were always assumptions, you know, there were always assumptions about, oh, she's some crazy feminist ap activist and, you know, sort of radical and so forth. So part of my uh, way of approaching it has been, I remember going into the UN in 2005 to do the first series of trainings for the Department of Political Affairs on what they were meant to do for 1325. It was develop, developing an action plan for the entire department and doing it with a colleague. And we used to joke that we go in dressed and looking exactly like the bureaucrats, you know, we put on a suit and, but, you know, so, the, so we blend in, but then what you're saying is really, really radical because it's stuff that they've never done and would, you know, hadn't thought about. Um, and it's, it's trying to open their minds. So, so it's this question of sometimes you need to be unconventional by pretending to be conventional, you know, and, and kind of, and then sometimes it's about going in and disarming the conversation. I was in Afghanistan sitting with a group of men having a conversation and, and in Farsi, you know, chatting with them about, about peace and security and peace council and this and that. And after an hour, um, I, giving examples from various places, I asked, I said, so what do you guys think about this and that? And this chap sitting next to me said, you're kind of little and you're kind of skinny, but you know stuff. So why don't you tell us? And I, and I started laughing because I was thinking, so for a whole hour, they had a perception of me based on what I looked like, but they had the respect or the patience or the time or whatever to sit and chat with me. And our conversation has taken us to a different level where we now are actually kind of, we've moved the, the, the ball along. So, so I, I think unconventional comes in all sorts of different ways, but certainly I've got lots of stories from colleagues from around the world who've also um, done things as, as, as Rita was saying. That sounds like, uh, you know, this idea of having, uh, getting these stories out and writing these stories. We could have one whole chapter on the unconventional approaches. Bonnie, I know you have uh, something to say here as well. Um, well, you know, I don't know if I can, I mean, there are, I, just thinking about the answer to this question, I, I would think most of the things that um, I have done um, is, I guess, unconventional approaches, but for me, it's how do you how do you attack an issue in a new way, um, and I rarely try to do things that um, has been done already, particularly if it hasn't worked. <laughs> um, so for me, it's always about what is the what is the what is the approach that hasn't been taken, um, and then you know putting putting my head down and just kind of pushing from there, and always thinking that somehow you're going to make it work. And you're going to adapt as necessary to push things through to make it work. So it's, it is an unconventional approach, but I look at it as the road, the road that has not been traveled, you know, and how do I, and by doing that, you're, you are attacking something from a different way than people have thought of before. So you're making inroads and you're making people think differently about something. Um, and that is a way in which um, 
people can open up their mind and be a little more open to something that they may have been closed mind to before. And then once you start doing that, you just, like I said, you put your, my, put my head down and just work on it and be, and as all these things, these difficult issues of peace and security, it's perseverance and persistence and getting yourself up and saying, okay, that, okay, dust myself off, take a deep breath and, you know, push again and give yourself a moment when you need it. But it's about, you know, once you got that plan and you start pushing, it's just, it's, it's perseverance. Yeah, I think it was Buddha who said, fall down nine times, get up 10 times. Well, we have just a few minutes left. And since we're talking about unconventional approaches, I wanted to end with this unconventional time of COVID-19. And what perhaps is the opportunity here for 1325 for women, peace and security and, and really looking at this issue of global health as a human security. And uh, would love any thoughts, opportunities. And if we can close this session with some optimistic signaling of the future, I would be grateful. We know the tough things ahead of us. Rita, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think um, in South Sudan, um, I would say uh, COVID-19 is not as much as in other countries. And uh, we thank God for that because it would really be a disaster if it gets to the level of other countries. But then when, um, uh, when, when the whole thing started, there was um, um, a lockdown from the government. And um, a, a few weeks ago, I visited um, a village that is like uh, an hour's drive from Juba. And um, it is not more about... COVID-19 itself, but the impact of the lockdown on the people. Because when the city was locked down, there was restriction of movement from Juba to other villages and for people from the villages to come into Juba just to curb the spread of, uh, of COVID-19. So the impact of that in the villages is that there were no doctors that traveled from Juba to the villages and there were no medicine. So they are the health facilities, but there are no doctors and uh, medicine. So kids, uh, children died, uh, the elderly also died. And uh, with the restrictions, social gatherings were forbidden. And uh, in the villages, most of these old people really depend on social gathering uh, to talk with people and also to find something to eat. Uh, most of them died of depression because there are no social gatherings, they are not able to find food. And in the communities, they also do uh, group farming. Last year, there was the outbreak of uh, locust. And uh, this year, they were not able to do group farming. So you just do individual farming, which is not um, productive. And uh, there is no food. So these are some of the impacts. And of course, uh, the schools were closed and the girls are at home and a lot of chores at home and there, there are violence uh, related because everybody is home. There is rise in, in the gender-based violence and many girls got pregnant and many other stories that got to that. So I One think- One sliver of hope. I think, yes, I'm getting to that is, <laughs> is that we have this resolution and it is still um, um, gives us hope as women all over the world, we are able to connect with each other. And I have met Ambassador Boni last year. I'm not sure whether she remembers me in the International Exchange Program um, in DC. And uh, just an amazing experience. I've also met Senam in New York. Uh, and there are other global networks like GNWP. And, um, and uh, within Africa, the, the, the gender is my agenda of the African Union. These spaces are all created to support women. And we should continue with the exchanges and building on uh, the women's movement to bring change in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Much. I love that idea of, of, of making sure these exchanges continue, whether virtually or in person. 
We have really one minute left. And uh, Sanam or Bonnie, a final word from you. We would be grateful. It'll have to be a brief statement. Bonnie? Okay, well, my, my statement is just to re reiterate what, what, re what you just said. I mean, for me, it's the, 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 the we, we know a lot of the negatives. The positive is this, is the exchanges. And I would certainly welcome opportunities to have more conversations like this with women around the world who are the peace builders. You know, so that is something that I think is an advantage and would love to do more of. Thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. Sanam, you have the final word in this conversation today about women transforming peace. So number one, I would say that it, it COVID shows us that our definition of security is much more relevant. If we're spending $880 million on a hypersonic drone and we don't have PPE and masks, there's something wrong in our country and elsewhere. Second, it shows that we shouldn't be talking about power sharing. We should be talking about responsibility sharing and look at who takes the responsibility to protect communities, which brings us to the third point, which is that COVID has shown us that women peace builders across conflict areas have been the first responders. I think it's the same in every community, actually. Women have been the first responders. And we need to go back to building up our local capacities and resilience for health, for livelihoods, for trusted messengers. Um, and essentially, it puts into question the entire 40 years of neoliberalism and privatization and, and, and basically thinking that you, know, you can talk to governments here and, and they'll do something on the ground. It's really a transformative um, moment. And I think that it provide, we, have, we have the answers, we have the precedents. It's just now putting the, that precedence of good practice to make it standard operating practice as opposed to reverting back to exclusion being the norm. Thank you. Thanks to each of you. Uh, this has been a really engaging conversation about women who run toward trouble to help solve these difficult, uh, violent, and in this case, we've just finished talking about the predicament of COVID. We want to salute the women peace builders around the world. Uh, we hope that this conversation today has opened up ideas, uh, enthusiasm, and as Rita said earlier, it begins with a self-conviction of a commitment to solving human problems without violence. Thank you all. Goodbye from Washington, DC, and hope to see you soon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you. Thank you.